uh, William Matchin has come to us in a, a zigzag fashion. Uh, he did his PhD at UC Irvine, uh, working with Greg Hickok and uh, John Sprouse. Uh, then he went on to do a postdoc at the University of Maryland. So he traveled to the other side of the country, working with Alan Lau. Um, and then he did another postdoc going back to California at UC Davis, where he worked with Rachel Maybury. And then he zigzagged to South Carolina, where he just arrived and we immediately grabbed him to talk to us about his favorite subject, the neural basis of syntax. So please give it up for uh, William Matchin. Thanks, Dirk, I appreciate that. It's definitely my favorite subject. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to be talking about that, and particularly here, I've been a follower of CSTAR and all the work coming out of uh, this department and the school and the interdisciplinary work. It's been fantastic. So I'm excited to be here and to talk to you about the work. Uh, Gregory Hickok and I have been working on this for a little while, so he's you know, my co-author on this. Uh, and I'll get started here. So we'll be talking about syntax. So I want to start off and just sort of you know, introduce you to this topic and why I find it so interesting and so important to study. So language is sometimes characterized in these phrases like the infinite use of finite means. What I'm doing right now, I'm making sentences. Sentences that you've never heard before, that I've never heard before, yet we have this capacity to combine what we informally call words into these hierarchical structures that create sentences that have novel meanings. And so this is a particularly interesting and perhaps unique capacity of humans in order to, to create new ideas out of thin air. Um, in particular, one thing I want to focus on is that the hierarchical structure is very important. So if you look at this figure on the right there, there's a sentence. This is like a traditional syntactic ambiguity example. Bob saw the man with binoculars. And the sentence has two meanings possible with it, right? So you can say, Bob saw the man, you know, and the man had binoculars. Or you can interpret it as meaning Bob used the binoculars with which to see the man. Okay, there are really two salient interpretations of the sentence. Why? And it's because of the hierarchical syntax. You can see that if you break down the words into different hierarchical structures, you can group that prepositional phrase with binoculars with the man, in which case it modifies the man himself, or you can group it with the verb phrase, which gives you information about the action. It's modifying the action of seeing. So this hierarchical structure, which we call syntax, is really core to how we understand the meaning of sentences. Um, and we can also think about syntax as this kind of interface between the sensory world and meaning. Okay, so we have these strings of words which come in that are unordered, or they're, they're, uh, they're not structured, okay? And syntax is able to impose this hierarchical structure such that we're able to get meaning out of it. And we're uh, calling attention to this similarity uh, to vision. So in vision, you also have these kind of bistable percepts. So you have the famous Necker cube, which is two. It's a, a series of 2D lines, right? And there are two three-dimensional interpretations of that object, two different uh, orientations of the, the, the plane that's in front. Okay, and it's a very automatic procedure that converts sensory data into a higher level percept. Okay, so well, not only do we think this is a superficial analogy with which to understand syntax, but actually a much deeper analogy in terms of homologous brain systems that underlie syntax. Okay, so I'll be talking about that a little bit more towards the end of the talk. Um, another thing about syntax is a very traditional way of looking at it is that there's really two things. You've got a lexicon, which is essentially the words that you know that have a particular pronunciation and a meaning, and you've got a system that combines them. Often they're called rules or procedures that basically take these words, compile them into structures which end up as sentences. Okay, and this is a pretty standard way of looking at that syntax. So you've really got two things, a lexicon and a grammar. And I'm also going to be really questioning this distinction, and that's going to be important for understanding the, what we're proposing as the neuro, neuroanatomical basis of syntax itself. Okay, so the standard view, or the sort of received view of syntax is this Broca's area model. So basically, there's an association of the temporal lobe with the lexicon or words. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. I'm just sort of going to assume that. There's plenty of neuroimaging and neuropsychology research. I could talk a little bit about that if you've got questions. But everyone kind of starts with that assumption. And so then 
the research proceeds from there by saying, okay, we've got the lexicon and the temporal lobe. It seems like the procedural rules of syntax live in the frontal lobe and Broca's area or the posterior inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, so we've got these words and rules. They map neatly onto these two distinct uh, biological systems, and that's the sort of received view. We're going to be <laughs> countering that and saying that's actually not quite right. In fact, we actually want to look at those rules, the syntactic system that allows you to combine words into structures, actually as in the temporal lobe as well. And actually, we want to collapse the notion of the lexicon and syntax into a unified lexical syntactic system that produces sentences that have interpretations throughout the rest of this temporal lobe ventral stream that we know is very important for comprehension and meaning. Okay, so the rest of this talk, I'm going to be discussing some of the evidence uh, regarding this issue. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about why we have some problems with the Broca's area model and what evidence supports this temporal lobe, um, in particular, the posterior temporal lobe model for syntax. Yeah, so as I said, first I'm going to talk about some evidence for and against the Broca's area model, in particular against and why that's important. And then I'm going to talk about this reconceptualization of syntax and how are we actually going to unify you know, the lexicon and the grammar, which are traditionally viewed as these very distinct kinds of things. And then talk about the, the clear evidence in favor of the stereotemporal lobe function. And then at the end, I'm gonna be talking about fluent aphasia and grammatical deficits in fluent aphasia, which are much less focused on in the literature. Everyone talks more about agrammatism, non-fluent aphasia, Broca's area. And I'm gonna say, well, there's actually some very interesting hints regarding the neurobiology of language in fluent aphasia and how this model can apply to that, how it can understand these different paragrammatism in fluent aphasia and agrammatism in non-fluent aphasia. Okay, so there's really three kinds of evidence that are central to our discussion. I don't have time to talk a lot about all of the evidence, there's a lot, and so if you've got questions after the talk, I'm happy to address that. So I'm gonna sort of pare it down to three general types. One is from neuropsychology, in particular from aphasia, and more recently, voxel wise lesion symptom mapping techniques, um, and then two different kinds of neuroimaging data, one regarding complexity of processing of sentences, another one looking at the actual complexity of the structures in the sentences themselves. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about agrammatism. This is the historical trajectory that really aligned Broca's area with syntax in the first place. Um, this patient is Carl. I think most of you guys may know Carl or have met Carl. There's a really wonderful movie called Aphasia the Movie. I recommend if you ever have a chance to watch the movie. If not, you can still go to his website and look at some sample videos. They're really striking in the sense that he very clearly himself just demonstrates what you know scientists will take dozens of years to collect data to show. He is very clear in his own you know, understanding of what's going on. And so what happens in agrammatism is you have what's called a telegraphic speech. You typically have omission of words that we associate with grammar, like function words, affixes. If you were in a case marking language, it'd be case morphology. Um, so, you know, this is an actual, actual quote from Carl, who's got this kind of aphasia, where he says, small words, no pictures, but cat, cat, you know, okay, cat, fine. Right? So he has no idea what to do with these small function words, where they go, what their purpose is, difficulty producing them but a word like cat with very rich semantic associations is much less of a problem. And this is associated with Broca's area, right? So this seems like a grammatical problem and we associate Broca's aphasia and agrammatism with Broca's area. That's pretty clear and, and dominant. So of course, you know, this is a complicated issue actually exactly, you know, which, which areas are damaged in patients of this kind. So luckily a lot of the research that's been going on here has been looking at this in more detail to say, do we actually have this association? And it's reasonable enough to say that there is an association. It's not perfect, but patients with Broca's aphasia tend to have damage to Broca's area. Patients with grammatical production problems also tend to have damage to Broca's area. So this is a reasonable enough you know, alignment. Okay. Now, that's just all in production. The study, I think, that really cemented the connection between Broca's area and syntax was the discovery of putative syntactic deficits in comprehension. So this is the seminal study by Karamatsa and Zurif, and they had sentences of different types. These were, you know, relative clause. Basically, you've got a subject that's modified by a relative clause, and the subject has to tell you what the proper interpretation of the sentence is. And the sentences are carefully designed 
such that you have two major noun phrases in the sentence, like the girl in the first sentence, or the girl and an apple. These are very asymmetric semantically, like girls are very agentive. They like to go around doing things, including eating. Apples are the opposite. They don't really go around doing much of anything, are typically eaten. Okay, so there's this canonical plausibility of the sentence. Also, they manipulated the word order. So the girl here is the subject of the main clause, as well as of the relative clause. The girl is tall, and she's eating the apple. So this is relatively straightforward, and patients do well on those sentences. The ones that they, they don't do well, these agrammatic patients, are the ones where you, you don't have the semantic constraint. So here you've got the last sentence, the girl that the boy chased is tall. Both girls and boys can chase. Right? They're equally plausible chasers or chasees. So we call this semantically reversible. It could be either one. And then you also have this non-canonical word order in the sense that the girl here is the object of chasing, even though it's the first entity that's mentioned, it's the subject of the main clause, but yet she's the one being chased. And subjects actually do shockingly poorly on this, these patients with Broca's aphasia. Actually also conduction aphasia in this study, which is uh, an association that's often overlooked, like rarely cited. In conduction aphasia patients, typically have more posterior lesions, they don't present with a grammatism, they're more fluent. But it's interesting, you actually see like a severe comprehension deficit for this particular study in both groups. But the focus historically was on Broca's aphasia, right? So this goes along with their production deficits and the idea is, wow, okay, this grammatical ability that humans have in order to combine words into sentences, that is, you know, really impaired in Broca's aphasia, that's associated with Broca's area of damage. Broca's area is like the you know, poster child for a language area in the brain. And so that, that was the association historically. There are some problems with this. So you, one, one was what I mentioned, like patients with conduction aphasia show the same pattern, yet they don't have a grammatism in the traditional sense. Another one is that patients with Broca's aphasia, as many of you are probably familiar with, because you work with these patients, they're aware of their deficits and they don't like to make errors. And they know when they're making errors. <laughs> That's a very interesting observation. Uh, how can you have a damage or loss of a particular system, but then know that what you're doing is wrong? What does it mean to know that you're doing it wrong? You know what the structures are in your language. And if you look at languages with more rich morphology, like German and Dutch, you see that you know, a lot of these old experiments are saying, well, actually, you know, these patients may not like to produce like inflected verbs, but when they do produce them, they put them in the right spot when they have uninflected verbs, they always put those in the right spot. Like they don't just sort of randomly produce them in various positions. There's actually a very systematic pattern which conforms to the grammar that they know or from their, from their native language. Or so that tells you that they actually know a lot about the grammar. And likewise, uh, for case marking, it's the same kind of thing. They don't like to produce, you know, case mark forms or they, they kind of reduce it to the canonical case marking form, but they don't erroneously produce them. They don't sort of like randomly kind of use them. Right, unless they're forced to, and then maybe they'll make errors with it. That shows you then again, they're very sensitive to the deficit. Um, likewise in comprehension. So this is this really important study by Linebarger and colleagues. It's often like not, not often cited, unfortunately. Um, but they actually took a bunch of these, a quote, agrammatic patients and asked them, here's a really subtle test of the grammar of English. Like really detailed tests. I just give you examples here, which are the sentences that are bad and which are good. And they just asked the patients, like this is what syntacticians do in their home offices, like ask themselves these questions to figure out what the syntax of English is. And then they just ask the patients, can you tell us the same answers? And it turns out that they're actually like really good at it, shockingly good at it, right? If they were, for instance, to have not have, you know, grammatical abilities. Um, there's some types of sentences that they did struggle with in this study. These are like uh, tag questions like the boy fell down, didn't he? You know, and you have to know that the he corresponds to the boy, the right gender on the pronoun. Um, or reflexives, they tend to do horror on those sentences, but I'm going to point out here that these are actually what, what are called long distance dependencies that tend to place a heavy demand on working memory. And that's going to be really important. I'll talk about that next. And so there's some chinks here in this idea that Broca's area and Broca's aphasia have to do with syntax, because these patients know a lot about syntax. Okay, I'm going to move on to talk about some of the neuroimaging evidence that's relevant to this question. So, you know, in psycholinguistics, it's been known for a long time that certain sentences are hard. Certain kinds of structures are harder to process than others. And this includes things like 
relative clauses, in particular, like object relative sentences, object class. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for this. Um, but what's nice about these kinds of sentences is that you can do sort of well-matched controls. So this was a neuroimaging experiment by Justin and colleagues in 96. And so they have simple active sentences like the reporter attacked the senator and admitted the error. Right? And then they compare this to a subject relative sentence, the reporter that attacked the senator admitted the error. Right? Semantically, the sentences are very similar in terms of the combinatorial semantics. The lexical items are almost identical. Right? But there's a structural difference, and it's known that the subject relatives induce longer reaction times, more errors, and even more so for an object relative sentence when you extract from the object position rather than the subject. So this is a reasonable control to say, well, look, the sentences are reasonably equally semantically rich, have the same kinds of lexical items. We know that there's a processing difficulty for certain sentences. That processing difficulty may have a lot to do with syntax in terms of how you structure the sentence. So what do those sentences look like in the scanner with healthy subjects that are perceiving these sentences? So what you see is you see Broca's area activity, typically more for these more complex, quote, more complex sentences than for the less complex ones. And this is a pretty robust finding. So these are just a hodgepodge of studies on the left. On the right is a meta-analysis of something like 20 studies. And what you see very consistently, posterior Broca's area showing up, being involved in these non-canonical, more difficult to process sentences. Interestingly, you actually also often see the posterior temporal lobe, right? That's rarely less often focused on. Okay, but this does provide some support for the idea that the IFG and Broca's area is being involved in syntax. But another caveat, right, even the, the people that perform these studies, like Just and Carpenter and colleagues, from the very beginning, they said, look, when you have this kind of non-canonical sentence, this processing complexity cost, there's, there's basically two things involved, both the additional syntactic operations to put things into the right structures, but also the memory resources that you need in order to hold on to the information for a longer period of time in order to perform those syntactic operations. Okay, so you have two things. Right? You've got the syntactic rules and you have memory resources to the extent that those are differentiable. Okay, we know already that patients that typically have frontal lesions and agrammatic profiles tend to also have uh, verbal, verbal working memory deficits. Right, so my, my, my colleague and former mentor, Greg Hickok, pointed out a long time ago, why don't we think it's working memory? Right, maybe these patients really have a working memory problem Maybe Broca's area reflects its working memory resources, and it's not really about the syntactic structure itself, the syntactic processes themselves. And so uh, we performed a neuroimaging study where we tried to look at this. Okay, so what we had subjects do is object relatives and subject relative sentences, the same kind of contrast. And we added this articulatory rehearsal task, where basically subjects have to subvocally go ba da ga da. Um, either on its own or while performing the sentence comprehension task. And the idea was that this is badly as kind of phonological loop. These are the working memory resources. What happens when we try to tax those resources while they're performing sentence comprehension? What you find is that the, the activation in the posterior, very posterior part of Broca's area, the difference between those two kinds of sentences goes away when you tax these resources, suggesting that whatever the increased activation was actually due to the taxing of working memory rather than syntax itself. And we also note that this subvocal phonological task equally activates the posterior Broca's area as strongly as the sentences. So that suggests that it is a working memory issue. And this is, again, a purely phonological kind of task. But we didn't actually get rid of activation in the more anterior part of Broca's area, the pars triangularis. Okay, so that leaves open the possibility that this region is doing something else, perhaps more specific to syntax. I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail, but some of the work that I've been doing um, has been suggesting that, well, we have, what, what is phonological working memory? It's the ability to articulate sequences of speech sounds, to hold them in memory. So maybe we can understand, you know, the contribution of the parse triangularis in terms of a higher order articulatory loop. Rather than just sequences of syllables or segments, we actually have articulation of sequences of morphemes at a higher level of representation to maintain syntactic information for syntactic analysis. Okay, so I've got some papers on that. I'm happy to answer some questions if you have more about that. Okay, this last uh, set of neuroimaging studies I want to talk about is our studies of structural complexity. So rather than looking at sentences that have unusual grammatical constructions like object relatives or multiple center embedding, which are kind of unusual in some way. And actually, if you look historically at English, you know, we didn't used to have those. Like if you look a thousand years ago, 
we didn't have center embedded sentences. We had these paratactic sentences where you kind of say this and this, and you kind of add a clause on the side, but you wouldn't embed it inside of it. Right? What's more and more core about syntax is the complexity of the of the combination of words into a phrase, whether or not you're looking at relative clauses or some kind of exotic construction, but really just how much do you combine things together? Like how many words are you combining into a single phrase or a sentence? So this is an interesting neuroimaging study done by Pally and colleagues. Um, it was actually done in French, but these are analogous English examples. So if you look at the bottom, you just have a sequence of words, right? That very bottom one above the italics, like thing very tree where of watching copy tense they states heart plus. I assume you guys don't have like a very rich interpretation of the meaning of that. If you do, I'm a little worried. Um, okay, so that's like the lowest level of complexity in terms of this fundamental creative capacity. If you look at the very top, you have a, a rich 12 word sentence. I believe that you should accept the proposal of your new associate, right? Now all the words are combined into a single sentence, right? To form a compositional meaning, which means something, you know, Maybe relevant to you, maybe not. Probably the subjects in the scanner didn't think it's too relevant, um, but obviously it has a more complex structure and meaning. Now, one of the issues that shows up often in this neuroimaging literature is this idea of syntax itself, which is abstract. You know, what are the words? How are they combined into a structure? And then there's the combinatorial meaning itself, right? So you have something like, you know, words that combine structurally, but then they also give a more complex meaning. So how can you tease those apart? They use what's called Jabberwocky. This is from Lewis Carroll. They have this famous Jabberwocky poem, which I will not recite for you. But basically what they do is they replace the content words. You can do this in English. You replace content words with non-words. And that retains the syntactic character of the stimulus, but removes greatly the semantic content. So I perceive that you should be gift the trope of all of your new of your two year eight. Right? Much less interesting semantically, but it feels like a sentence. And when I say feels like a sentence, I mean it's syntactically well formed. So they try to dissociate those two things. So what they're doing is, what are the brain regions that show more activation for more structural complexity? And can we dissociate whether it shows that regardless of the semantic content, or is it really contingent on the semantic complexity of the stimulus? So what they show is that, you know, like the left hemisphere, all of the quote language related areas show this effect for the stimuli with all real words. So they're all interested in this combinatorial complexity. But there's only a couple areas that care about that complexity in the abstract sense, in the sense of just the syntactic structure and not without requiring the semantic contribution. And those two areas are basically Broca's area and the posterior temporal lobe. Okay. Um, so this provides some additional evidence in favor of the Broca's area view. Um, but it also suggests that this posterior temporal area, like there's really there's really no hard distinctions in the neuroimaging literature between posterior temporal lobe and Broca's area activation. You find an interesting profile of activation for Broca's area, you also find it in the posterior temporal lobe. So where, so an additional important source of data are sense comprehension, sense comprehension tasks uh, in patients with aphasia. So syntax, is important for sentence comprehension because it feeds into the meaning of the sentence. So presumably, if you have a syntactic deficit, you're going to also have deficit sentence comprehension. And this, again, goes back to agrammatism. Canonically, these patients are really good at comprehension. Okay, but if we actually go in and say, now, where are the lesions associated with sentence comprehension deficits? Just where are they? And what it turns out is that they're overwhelmingly in the temporal lobe for basic sentence comprehension problems. So this has been looked at across a variety of labs, including here and otherwise. Um, and basically, if you look at sense comprehension tasks, various kinds, their most robust associations are in the temporal lobe, in particular, the posterior temporal lobe. And there's actually a particular study done by Jeff Binder's group, this is Pile and colleagues, where they look at the effect of sense comprehension when regressing out the effect of word comprehension. So they're saying, where are brain areas when they're more damaged in pair sense comprehension controlling for the just the simple effect of word comprehension. And what pops up is the posterior temporal lobe, right? Right in the posterior middle temporal gyrus, which is the area that we're talking about for being important for syntax. So while we look at the neuroimaging data and we can see similarities between the posterior temporal lobe and the inferior frontal gyrus, they're really dissociated with respect to aphasia and brain damage. 
right? If you've got a broker's area damage, you have some problems with production, but you have a lot of knowledge of syntax and you can understand what's going on. If you've got damage to the posterior temporal lobe, then you're really impaired. Okay, so we think this is really the important distinguishing factor. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to mention just to sort of clean things up. The anterior temporal lobe is often talked about as an area important for syntax. That's because in these neuroimaging studies, it often pops up as an area that shows uh, for more combinatorial complexity, like sentences versus word lists, or the study that I mentioned by Pallier and colleagues. Um, so for a while, people were talking about the ATL as being a critical area for syntax. But there's a couple problems with that, one of which is if, you, if patients with semantic dementia, progressive primary aphasia of the semantic type, this is strongly associated with interior temporal lobe atrophy, they seem to be fine with respect to sentence level comprehension in many studies, and also particularly for syntax. So Stephen Wilson has a nice review paper where you look at a variety of different measures of syntactic abilities, and these patients seem to be fine. So the anterior temporal lobe, it just show up a lot, but it's just not reliably associated with sentence comprehension, or at all with syntactic deficits in particular. Okay. So we come back to the posterior temporal lobe. And we we'll just want to point out that Stephen Wilson actually proposed a similar kind of model in a recent paper of his. It was a really nice neuroimaging paper um, where he talks about the sort of, you know, topological organization of the temporal lobe with respect to language. And he puts a syntax area right basically where we put our area. So if you agree with Stephen Wilson, you know you're doing something right. Um, and the idea here, again, is that there's this syntactic area in the posterior temporal lobe. These two red areas are different kinds of semantic processing. In particular, we talk about this distinction between representations of entities in the anterior temporal lobe or like features associated with things and people and places. And the angular gyrus, this is in the posterior temporal parietal areas, is being associated with events and actions and relations among entities. I'm not going to talk about that too much in detail. I'm happy to answer questions about that. We kind of borrowed that from Binder and Desai, as well as a lot of other data. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. But it's a very similar organization as to what Stephen Wilson has proposed. And so what I want to talk about now is we were reconceptualizing syntax. This is there's another conceptual motivation for thinking about syntax in the frontal lobe as being this sort of a form of procedural memory. Okay, so we talk about procedural memory as like a skill of motor ability. And then people often conceptualize syntax as this frontal motor procedural kind of thing. But we're really trying to shift that and say, we're really thinking about it as a perceptual system, right? And getting going back to this analogy with vision, it's a set of procedures for converting between sensory expressions in the environment. They could be auditory or in sign language, could be visual. And then feeding that into a semantic representation. It's more of a transducer than a skill at least with respect to these hierarchical combinations that we think are particularly important for the, this creative aspect of language. Okay. Um, another point we want to make about these areas, again, is this modality independence. So I mentioned sensory things, okay? But we don't just mean auditory stimuli. We mean that this is a really a modality independent property of human language that feeds into semantics, that is able to connect to different kinds of sensory systems but really is in, in its core, a more abstract layer of processing. And so some evidence in favor of this, again, comes from Stephen Wilson's nice neuroimaging study, where he shows that these areas don't discriminate between written and auditory speech. And a study that we worked on when I was in UC San Diego, um, we basically did that version of the Pallier study, but in American Sign Language, in deaf native signs of ASL. Okay, so we there's no auditory stimulation, the patients are deaf, they're native signers of ASL. We present stimuli with the same varying complexity of the combinatorics. And what we show is that, particularly in the temporal lobe, both in the anterior and posterior temporal lobe, we get that same correlation of activity. And actually, if you if you take the overlap between these clusters and the palliate clusters, it's very tight. Like these are actually the same cortical regions. Okay, so this is again a really it's a what we think of this as a component of human biology that's flexible in some sense. It can connect to different sensory systems. And as its core, again, is about semantics, about meaning. Okay. I have a little bit of uh, homework to do here. 
so what about this difference between lexicon and syntax? And I talked about this sort of fundamental and everyone agreed upon. And now I'm kind of, you know, I haven't been explicit about it so far. What we're really claiming is that the same cortical system involved in the lexicon is also involved in the syntax. And it should be that way. That that's actually not a contradiction. Why is that? Well, if you actually look across syntactic theories, what you see is that all theories posit to some degree their structure associated with words or stored on words. So some of this has to do with um, subcategorization. And, and if you guys might be familiar, but actually some of the work that uh, Dirk has been doing has been looking at this specifically. So words are very peculiar in terms of how they play with other words. So verbs in general like to have, let's say, noun phrase complements, like a verb like kill or stab would take a noun phrase complement. But some verbs like to take clauses like think, that, et cetera. Or other verbs might even take a prepositional phrase complement, and some verbs are compatible with multiple types of complements. All syntactic theories have to deal with this. Okay, so we already have to say all words have to be stored along with a bit of structure that they combine with, how they combine with other words and phrases. Um, and this is also similar to what's commonly done in psycholinguistics. So not just in syntactic theory, but in people that study sentence processing, we talk about lemmas often in, in, in a word and sentence production models. What is a lemma, right? And a lemma is, is just the syntactic description of a word, right? It's syntactic category, subcategorization. In languages with gender, you might store gender. Okay, so we're very, like, it's, you can't get away from the notion of word without talking about syntax. It's an intimate component of what a word actually is itself, is how it plays with other words. And if you actually look at subcategorization, this is the work that I mentioned that, that Dirk has been working on. Um, if you manipulate the subcategorization complexity, you get effects in different regions of the, of the brain, but particularly you get it in the posterior temporal lobe. Okay, very similar to the spot that we've been talking about. Um, another issue is uh, we often talk about syntactic rules. Like a typical thing in syntax is talk about a phrase structure rule that generates a bit of structure like a noun phrase can be compiled of, it can be comprised of a determiner and a noun phrase. So this is a rule basically saying you can take a determiner and a noun phrase and put them together and get uh, an, an, another noun phrase. Okay. Or you could take, you know, an, a sentence goes to NPBP. Right? You can take a noun phrase and a verb phrase, you can combine them into make a sentence. And this is what people are typically talking about when they talk about procedural rules. But actually, it's not complicated to convert that into a lexicalized bit of structure in the same way that I've been talking about. So you can think of this as a rule, or you can simply think of this as sometimes what's called a treelet, like a little snippet of a syntactic tree, the syntactic tree, and then store it in the lexicon along with other lexical items. Right? So it's actually pretty straightforward in order to convert to convert rules into lexical items. And in this sense, what we're saying is, is that they're all properties of the same system. Okay, there's a system in the posterior temporal lobe that stores syntactic stuff. That means the syntactic descriptions of actual words with bits of phonology and semantics, and then more abstract bits of syntax, like phrase structure rules. Okay, and that's what we're saying. Um, and, and if this is true, if this alignment is true between grammatical rules and the lexicon, then you actually would expect overlap. And so what I talked about earlier, there's a host of studies that look at lexical effects in the posterior temporal lobe. And it's also not surprising that we see, again, all of these syntactic effects occurring on the same, same areas. OK. OK, so this is the last part of the, the talk, which is a little speculative and love for your feedback. And this is also work that we're uh, continuing here um, in South Carolina. So I've been talking about syntax in the posterior temporal lobe, but again, what about Broca's area? What about the neuroimaging patterns of activation? What about agrammatism? Like, why do you see those kinds of deficits to begin with? And I mentioned a little bit about this sort of morphosyntactic working memory system. We want to be a little bit more explicit about that. So if you look at a syntactic tree, like you take this example here in English, like a little verb phrase like chase the cat, there's really two dimensions to the tree. There's the hierarchy, which things are higher up, and that is really critical for determining semantic interpretation. There's also the order, which thing comes first, which comes second. If you have affixes in your language, is it a prefix? Is it a suffix? That is really important in terms of the order. Okay. And so if you actually look across languages, what's interesting is that you see similarities in the hierarchical structures. So is the Japanese, this is, you know, like a uh, kato, uh, we kakita, 
right? So you've got a cat, you know, you got the noun phrase cat, which is an object with a case marker, which because attaches the suffix, and that's really different between the two languages, but yet you both have a verb phrase comprised of a noun phrase and a verb, which is important for telling you that the noun phrase is the object of the verb semantically. So what we're trying to do is actually dissociate these two things. There's actually, what we're claiming here is that there's a neuroanatomical distinction for these two uh, properties of syntax. The order part of it is associated with the frontal lobe, procedural memory, sequence processing, and the hierarchical part of that in terms of the syntactic features and how they're arranged that's important for semantic computation, that's in the posterior temporal lobe. And so this is just a kind of a cartoon to illustrate what we're talking about here, is that this linear types of information that's, that's really critical for articulation, right? Like I'm speaking a sentence to you, I wish I could just give you the hierarchical structure. You're gonna feel like, like here's the tree of what the sentence is. And then I would avoid all sorts of things like ambiguity and long distance dependencies that are hard to process. Like what is a long distance dependency? In this sense, we mean it's like it's linearly far apart, which is hard for you to process. Okay, but unfortunately I'm speaking. My vocal tract only allows me to say one word at a time. And so I have to put things out in order. And, and so in, in order to articulate that, I have to spit things out in order. And so what we think is that the, the anterior part of Broca's area is really important for determining these morphosyntactic linear relations. How do you arrange things in order in order to get it out for production? And the posterior temporal lobe is again more associated with comprehension and semantics. How do I arrange the items into a hierarchical structure such that I can figure out what goes where semantically? You know, who's doing what to whom in the sentence? And now uh, this uh, sort of converges with some recent developments in linguistics where people have talked about this distinction and, and suggested a similar kind of distinction. So we find that encouraging, helpful. And so just to, to wrap it up, uh, this is a, a production model, a neuroanatomical production model from Greg Hickok. Um, and it focuses on the phonological level. And the idea is that there's these ventral stream components and dorsal stream components, right? So you've got like phoneme representations, um, that there's, there's like sort of a sensory phoneme representation and a motor phoneme representation. And you've got these auditory syllable representations that are broader, and you've got these motor syllable representations that are broader. And then of course, you've got the lexical and conceptual levels that feed into that in order to guide your production. And so what we wanna do here is sort of explode this a bit. I hope this is not too overwhelming. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is like, I'm taking this green box and then I'm splitting it into two, right? So we talk about the lemma what we really mean now is lexical syntactic. You've got hierarchical stuff, ventral stream, linear stuff, dorsal stream. Okay, and then these, this, you know, these red boxes, you don't have to worry about that too much. I can answer some questions if you're curious. But really, we're just sort of expanding the hierarchical thing incrementally to incorporate the syntactic level, the lexical syntactic level of representation. Right, and so when I talked about syntactic working memory before, we can actually now have a corresponding neuroanatomical system for that. So for phonological working memory, and a lot of previous research has looked at this, we're looking at, you know, more speech related areas like an STG, uh, you know, posterior, posterior inferior frontal gyrus and premotor cortex, and then offer the syntactic level working memory, anterior IFG and middle temporal gyrus. Okay, and this last bit, so, uh, one of the syndromes that hasn't been talked about so much with respect to syntax is Wernicke's aphasia and paragrammatism. So paragrammatism, so agrammatism sort of means omission of grammatical elements, like not producing the finite verb, the closed class items, etc. Paragrammatism is the misuse or the erroneous use of grammatical information. So these are just speech samples from various patients with Wernicke's aphasia of paragrammatism. So um, the first one's kind of long here, but another one, another one would be like, it happens very good. They're not prepared to be of helpful, and I want everything to be so talk. She was handled to look at the books a bit. Do you nothing about pubs, right? Like these, you know, there's like, uh, there's, a, there's clearly a fluency and a presence of a lot of these grammatical elements, but they seem to be arranged in strange kinds of ways, erroneously. And then, of course, if we look at the neuroanatomical distribution of Wernicke's aphasia, we see it centered right on the posterior temporal area that we're interested in, the middle temporal gyrus. So what we're interested now is to, to actually try to look at paragrammatism per se. 
As I mentioned earlier, there's this very problematic assumption that Baroque's aphasia and agrammatism correspond to Baroque's area. And so it's important, and the studies were done, to actually show that particular deficits in production of grammar correspond to those particular anatomical systems. And so what we're interested in now is, can we show the same thing for paragrammatism? Instead of assuming the relationship between Wernicke's aphasia, paragrammatism, and a particular system, we actually want to show, do those deficits correspond to the posterior temporal lobe? And how that, how that might impact, you know, the deficits that we actually see in these patients. Okay, um, so this is just a kind of schematic to, to illustrate what I'm talking about. How does this neuroanatomical production model work? So for a healthy person, um, you have a hierarchical structure. It's got some syntactic features and some semantic features. Those both connect up with the frontal articulation systems and everything is normal. Like you might say a sentence or a phrase like serenaded the squid appropriately with all the elements present in the correct order, et cetera. And then for agrammatism, <coughs> you've got damage to this dorsal stream. And so the problem here is that you don't have the syntactic hierarchical representation to guide your production. And so those elements are difficult to retrieve and difficult to produce. You don't have that to guide what you're producing. And so what you're left after, you have these semantic features, and we think there's a ventral and tarot sort of uh, anterior ventral route, which allows you to say the semantically rich items like content words, but these grammatical elements are a lot harder because you don't have the, you don't have the target, you don't have the syntactic target in order to produce it. And then for paragrammatism, you have damage to the syntactic features themselves. Okay, so what you have left over are these sequences, these morphological sequences. You have the elements like case marking, past tense morphology, closed class items, those are there but they're not being guided by the hierarchical structure. So you're gonna erroneously select them occasionally. You're gonna make some errors, but you don't know that there's any problem with that hierarchical syntactic representation. So you might say serenaded a squids. You might incorrectly select you know, a singular def, uh, indefinite determiner and a plural you know, morpheme. Those representations are entirely intact, but you don't know if there's anything wrong with the hierarchical syntactic relationship there. And so you, you just say it anyway, and you're not aware of the deficit. This is the speculation. Okay, and so finally, I just want to say, we're, again, you know, the analogy to vision is not just an analogy. We're really positing that there's a deeper homologous organization in terms of brain systems. So, of course, in vision and audition, this dual stream architecture has been very popular, sort of processing what a thing is and how or where it is, like where it is in space or how to interact with that. And then, and Greg in particular has been pushing this for phonological level representations. So for speech, how do you perceive speech? What is it acoustically? And how are you going to formulate your gestures in order to produce that sound? And then they're going to, now we're extending that even further to the level of syntax. What is the syntactic structure? And then what is the sequence of morphological elements that you need in order to affect that structure? Okay, so that's it. I just want to thank, um, you know, Ellen and her lab in Maryland, who are really fantastic. We did some neuroimaging work that bears on this question and talked a lot about these issues. So I want to thank them and also want to thank everyone in San Diego, in particular Rachel Mayberry in her lab, where we did some really cool stuff in American Sign Language and also talked a lot about these ideas. Um, in particular, I want to thank Greg Hickok. I've been working with him. This is equally his contribution. Um, and I also want to thank everyone here been talking about these ideas and getting some new projects started, which I'm excited about, and also the, the NIH for funding. And thank you. So I suggest we take uh, questions from the, uh, the room first, and then, then we take questions from online. Sounds great. Me. Julius, what's up? So uh, you didn't talk at all about the right hemisphere. So no, yeah. You know, the, the yeah, yeah. Being oh yeah. No, interest, no, I'm extremely interested in that, and I'd like to work on a grant application on that. Um, I do think the system is going to be bilater uh, bilaterally organized. There's a few dorsal and ventral. I think there's asymmetries in the computation that performed. So I, so Greg and I probably disagree on this. He would say that dorsal is going to be left lateralized and ventral is bilateral. But I have some speculations that are aspects of the dorsal that might also be right lateralized. Um, but the short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure, please. Uh, 
that um, last speculative point that you made about um, this very case of Asia. This, yeah, like a right. So, and even in these examples, it kind of shows up that these patients have, tend to kind of invent words and use neologies yeah, and so yeah. forth. And they do make a whole bunch of semantic errors right. that I don't know are clearly attributable to kind of the syntactic dilemma specific information, the syntactic features, as opposed to something that according to your model might be more anterior. Well, I think that is a very important question that we want to iron out. Mm -hmm. Can you share that again? Sure. Share and then go back to your problem. Oh, I like the other one, I guess. Just do it as a slide presentation. Okay, yeah. There you go. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. question. Obviously, there are semantic impairments, neologisms. There's a, I guess there's a question of like how much of those things can be aligned. I mean, we are saying that lemmas are part of the system. So if you lose a representation of a lemma, you might have word finding problems or neologistic problems. But we also think we would agree that there's probably some separable deficits that are not straightforwardly attributed to that. But we're talking about a system that's nestled in between areas that are key for semantics in the anterior temporal lobe and the angular gyrus. It's not surprising if you have a lesion that's going to encompass both of those. So we would really like to do some more detailed work in ironing out the various components. Like where do you get the new logistic problems? Where do you get the more syntactic level problems or other kinds of problems? We want to iron that out. I agree with you. So. Yes? I was just going to ask a question more about uh, assuming the same structure or lexicon of a particular phrase or sentence. Do you see any? Like effects of the speaker? I mean, what's the role of the speaker in how someone might you know, interpret it? Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Can you elaborate a little bit? I, I... Well, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to think, assuming uh, the same like, phrase, do you see some differences in who is, is, ah. is speaking? I mean, who's, who's well, that's a really broad question. Yeah. I mean, that's a really deep question that it comes up a lot. I mean, I, I do think that's important in the overall sense of you know thinking more broader about communication. Like, obviously, even the form of grammar that you use is going to depend on the person you're talking to. Like in certain languages, less so in English, but other languages like Japanese, for instance, I've got a really, my roommate, San Diego, is from Japan. He says that he really can't do science in Japan because he never worked or ever went to university there, and there's grammatical structures or formal interactions he never learned. Right? So, uh, you know, that, that's an important element that I, you know, I, we should be worked on. At the same time, I also think that there are other things that are consistent that don't depend on that. You know, like if I say the word cat, it doesn't really depend too much on who's saying it or what tone of voice I say it. There's something in common among all those instances of cat that is the same. So in some sense, I agree. In the other sense, I do think that there are things that are independent of that that we can study and get at that are well-defined, at least with respect to linguistics and psycholinguistics, which I often use as sort of guides for what I'm doing. But you know, if there are ideas, then we should do them. Um, so it's been suggested, of course, as you, as you know, because we talk about this stuff all the time, um, that uh, agrammatism and paragrammatism are basically two different adaptations to essentially no. the same uh, underlying problem, right, in the 90s, the whole condition. Right. So if, if paragrammatism in the slide that you have up there, and these turns out to be associated with that green area, um, is paragrammatism the new agrammatism? The real agrammatism? <laughs> well, I guess it's just these labels are not helpful labels. And stuff. They're useful in one sense. I think they're particularly useful in describing symptoms. But I don't think we want to necessarily use them as describing the ideology or the systems underlying it. Like, I don't want to say, I, can, I think it's fine to say a patient with paragraphs that you can say, look, that means that they misuse grammatical structures. Fine. But I don't want to make the same mistake I was made before and saying agrammatism hey, means no grammar. You know? So I, I do we should probably be careful with that. One more? Yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. Sure. So um, looking at your uh, slide about the, the next one, I think. Yeah, that one. Sure. So when you're thinking about um, patients, mm -hmm. are we thinking of, is the problem with processing in the specific areas, or is it that disconnection problem? Well, that disconnection is super important, and something I almost entirely admitted. I mean, uh, 
uh, you know, you can, you can go with the real old school disconnection syndrome model, which is not so bad in certain ways. I mean, obviously the information that's stored in the cortical area has to be transmitted to the cortical area. If you disrupt the pathway, you're gonna have problems there. So that's why I try to be careful like with these lesion distributions and try to say, well, you might get a similar deficit through disconnection or cortical damage. And that's also gonna be important for lesion symptom mapping because you, know, you may be mislocalizing the cortical locus of something when you have the white matter that's damaged. And that's like way more posterior to the cortical system it's trying to connect to. So yeah, that's, a, that's an important detail that I almost entirely admitted. Yeah. I don't see any questions online, so we can just keep going. Okay. I'm just curious if you know uh, about the distribution of different type of uh, conventional aphasia syndromes uh, in languages that are more or less free order, because it seems like your model would actually you know, predict in a language that allows yeah. more free order and allows more lemma type information. Well, I think that's actually an interesting question because you know when I say words, that's not the right term. I really mean morphemes. Okay. And so we'll take a language like German. It's more free word order, but it also has much richer morphology, case morphology. You know, I don't know about verb inflections. And I don't think that, I don't want to make a big distinction between word order per se and morpheme ordering. Like you, you can't just stick a case on the front, right? There's an ordering relation. And even, even order is also a tough idea because it may not be order per se that we're interested in in terms of more about what's the sensory motor uh, ramifications of producing this. And so, you know, it's order, order is important in terms of how you get the words out, but it's also what's the phonological exponent of a particular morpheme. That's also going to be relevant, I think, to this. You know, so yeah. So there should, but there should be some difference in kind of the distribution of syndromes. There could be. There could be some difference in distribution of syndromes. You might see differences in neuroimaging studies. I mean, I think that we would want to sit down and really think about that and look at. And, and the problem is that you have to have a detailed theory to do that well, because you take a language of free word order that's like you know agglutinating and it has affixes. Is it really different fundamentally in that way? Right, or is it not? And this is something I think a lot about for American Sign Language, because American Sign Language, you know, it doesn't have the same morphological complexity that you have um, in English or like in German, let's say. Um, but you know, you do have parallel grammatical expressions. I find that very fascinating, actually. I mean, the fact that you know, the ordering components of language are tied to how you produce is kind of supported by this phenomenon in American Sign Language or other sign languages where you're able to express certain radical features in parallel because your manual effectors allow for that. So the question is like, why do you see parallel radical features in ASL and not so much in English? Well, because I'm speaking in English and I'm signing in ASL, which again suggests that it's the motor system driving those representational properties. So I, that's a really fascinating question. I thought about it for ASL and the sign languages and you know, it's just, it's like hard. So yeah, that would be a great thing to do. One more. Sure. Is there a chance of the, the angular gyrus box that you have there? Yeah. Way at the end. Uh, we talk about semantic features. Yes. Um, is there a possibility that you might have to have to call that green if if it turns out that verbs and their argument structure which have such a, yeah. an impact on syntactic structure um, are supported by by that, 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 that cortical region? Yeah, but that region well, does something to activate. Yeah, I know you're talking about like your work, it's the accountant's work, where you, you have, you know, verbs with, with complicated argument structures tend to activate the angular gyrus as well as the posterior temporal lobe. I think you have to be careful in interpreting the results of the studies. So that's why I highlighted the particular study that you did, because it focuses on subcategorization itself, which is a syntactic relation. And then there's also the semantic relations. So you know, if you have different kinds of arguments, it's also different kinds of semantic things that you like to play with, which is exactly what we're talking about, relational semantics and angular gyrus. And there is one study, I think it was by Chetreat, I can't remember, but they tried to dissociate semantic arguments and syntactic arguments. And I believe, I have to look at it again, but they found the syntactic effects in the temporal lobe and not the angular gyrus. So I thought that was at least some evidence to suggest that you can dissociate that. But that's obviously important. 
I mean, the biggest evidence, I mean, we could, I could talk about this for a while. Well, but it like, may also be a move. I was, I was right. expecting you to say that's a move point, but you call it syntax or semantics. I mean, well, I, it depends on what you, it depends it depends on what you mean by the word, right? If by syntax, you mean abstract without reference to semantic features, without direct reference. I don't see syntax feeds into semantics, it's critical for it. But, like, you know, there's, there's evidence like this, for instance, in the Pallier study where you get really clear effects of semantic complexity in the angular gyrus of TPJ. And then you don't get any syntactic effects, which I think are important, you know, converging with those data. Any other questions? No questions online? Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you.